The United States of America is a nation which has always prided itself on its success under a representative government. While the values and philosophy that inspired the creation of this democratic system were certainly important in many Founding Fathers' decision to declare independence from Britain in the first place, we should remember that determining the country's future was not an easy or quick process, and that, much like today, not everyone agreed on what the best system of government was. Even when the War of Independence was over, and the nation secured its existence in 1783, it wasn't clear how the new nation, or possibly even nations, were going to run themselves. It would be a few more years before the fundamentals of modern American government were finally in place. Among the many voices throughout the country taking part in this debate were those who favored placing a monarch in charge of the country. Fascinatingly, among these American monarchists, there may have been some who did more than simply suggest the idea. There is evidence, largely forgotten history, that there were some who, in fact, quietly worked to place a prince from Germany on an American throne. Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Fire of Learning. I'm Justin. In this video, we'll be talking about American monarchism, and more specifically, what is remembered as the Prussian Scheme. The year is 1786. The Constitution under which Americans today live is still a few years away from being implemented. The new nation is still under the Articles of Confederation, something which could be considered a proto-constitution that many at the time felt was seriously failing. Many believed it was time to reassess it, others to replace it entirely, and some felt that the only thing that could truly bring the divided states together and end the chaos was a monarch. The call for a monarch was of course not very loud. Likely most of the hardline traditionalists with notable influence who would have pushed for such a thing had simply sided with the British in the first place, and were now among the tens of thousands leaving the country for places like Canada. Regardless, there were enough American monarchists to make the topic worth talking about. This idea, not as bold then as it is now, left one question. Who? Prior to this, there was at least one individual who suggested this hypothetical throne to George Washington as a solution to America's problems under the Articles of Confederation. In the 1782 Newburgh letter, Colonel Louis Nicola wrote to General Washington citing the failures of the contemporary European republics in comparison to its monarchies and suggesting that he become king and form a kind of constitutional monarchy. In other words, a monarchy combined with a democratic system much like the British. Quote, Some people have so connected the ideas of tyranny and monarchy as to find it very difficult to separate them. It may therefore be requisite to give the head of such a constitution as I propose some title apparently more moderate, but if all other things were once adjusted, I believe strong arguments might be produced for admitting the title of king, which I conceive would be attended with some material advantages." End quote. Washington flatly refused the idea. Years later, in 1787, Alexander Hamilton, who greatly admired the British system of government, would argue in favor of the idea of electing a president for life, though he stressed that this wasn't monarchial, as this position was impeachable. If there were ever a chance at American monarchy, the disagreement with Hamilton's principles combined with, more importantly, Washington's disinterest in becoming king were probably the nail in the coffin for it. But this is only clear to us in hindsight. But if not Washington, then who else could be a proper candidate? Well, a natural move at this point would be to turn to candidates from the monarchies of Europe. In this case, Prussia. Inviting a foreigner to become monarch was not as unusual as it sounds, and America would not have been the first nor the last to do so. The national backgrounds of many European monarchs in history, in fact, were different from the nations over which they ruled, although admittedly this was more often a product of intermarriage and inheritance. But while these American monarchists would have expected this foreign monarch to rule independent of the nation from which they hailed, they still had to be very careful about which country to choose from. So why Prussia? Britain, for obvious reasons, was not very high on the list, though there were unfounded fears that the throne could be given to George III's second son. A candidate from the Bourbon houses of France or Spain, then? Well, these countries had emerged as America's first allies, and there were positive relations between their governments, but they weren't too friendly. 
France and Spain were firm Catholics first of all, and while America was leaning towards freedom of religion, the de facto elite was Protestant. Furthermore, France had been a recent threat in the French and Indian War, now in distant but living memory, as had Spain, with plenty of potential for both of them to be future threats to American sovereignty as well, given their obvious colonial ambitions. The Dutch had also become cordial with the Americans, and they were Protestants, but the Netherlands was a republic itself. I would like to make it clear as well that there is no clear evidence that monarchists were reaching these exact conclusions about these various countries, but given the attitudes of their contemporaries and given the fact that they did eventually apparently choose Prussia, these were very likely the reasons. If you aren't familiar with Prussia, long story short, Germany as the nation we know it today did not come about until 1871. Until then, it consisted of a multitude of different countries, weakly and awkwardly united in a confederation called the Holy Roman Empire. The two most powerful German countries at this time were Austria and Prussia. Prussia was currently under its most famous monarch, Frederick II the Great, who was, in his old age, not Britain's friend. The French and Indian War roughly 25 years earlier had been only one theater of the broader Seven Years' War, in which Prussia and Britain had been allies. However, despite their alliance, the Prussians were very much left to deal with the European mainland on their own. Frederick watched his armies be slaughtered as he took on France, Austria, and Russia nearly completely on his own. He was only inches away from total defeat, and had come to resent the British for their lack of assistance in the war, to the extent that he had openly approved of American independence. As a Protestant power without significant colonial ambitions that resented the British, the House of Hohenzollern that ruled Prussia was a natural candidate house. Not King Frederick himself, of course. Again, the goal would be to have their own monarch from an established house, not to submit to another country or even end up in something like a personal union. Thus, Frederick's younger brother Heinrich, or Henry, was considered the best candidate, as he was both experienced and not likely to inherit the Prussian throne. A reasonable choice, but hold on. What evidence is there that people were really thinking about this, and whose idea was this exactly? Well, this is a bit of a murky area of history, but based off what is known. The first to suggest it may have been a man named Nathaniel Gorham, who served at the time as President of the Continental Congress. According to the autobiography of the contemporary politician Rufus King, Gorham secretly suggested the idea to Prince Henry. He also claims that Prince Henry declined, and responded by saying, quote, the Americans had shown so much determination against their old king that they would not readily submit to a new one." End quote. Whether or not this was true was unclear. For quite a while, evidence for such a scheme was that Mr. Rufus ambiguously said it happened. Naturally then, it was considered a bit of a myth. But then, in the 19th century, a very interesting letter was discovered. A letter written by Prince Henry of Prussia, intended for the Baron von Steuben, a former Prussian military officer who famously helped train the American military during the war. Von Steuben had served under Prince Henry in the Seven Years' War, establishing a friendship between them. In 1911, Richard Crowell published the collective evidence, including this letter. It appears that the letter was drafted in early 1787, the letter, written in French, the lingua franca of the age, is left intentionally ambiguous for fear of interception, but he seems to be responding to two letters, one from Steuben and La Lettre d'un de vos amis, a letter from one of Steuben's friends. This letter, which the American friend wrote, evidently astonished Prince Henry and pertained to the principles of government that have been established in the United States. Henry wrote that he, quote, doubted they could be changed unless the whole of the nation was in agreement, end quote. He then added, but if the whole nation would choose for its model the Constitution of England, according to my judgment, I must admit that it is of all the constitutions the one which seems to me the most perfect, end quote. Long story short, the writing suggests that the letter pertained to constitutional monarchy in America, Henry's doubt that such a system could ever exist there, but his approval of the system overall. Furthermore, Prince Henry adds at the end of his letter, quote, 
I'm going to France this autumn, and perhaps I shall find one of your friends there. The French are, to this hour, the true allies of the United States of America. If you would like to read the full letter yourself, I have translated it into English. You may find that in the description of this video. I'd like to thank the Aggie Man, Grizzly, and Nappy on Discord for giving me a few points about translation. And I would like to thank Tracy Shamoon for being the fluent French speaker who reviewed and approved the whole thing. Is this letter evidence, then, of a proposal to Prince Henry himself to fill the role of monarch were the Americans to decide on an English style of government? And was the letter attached to von Steuben's referenced in this response, in fact, from the pen of Nathaniel Gorham? Sadly, we may never know for sure. Both sides were justifiably rather hesitant to discuss the subject openly. If there were a serious proposal, however, it appears Henry was not hugely interested in the position. His last quote mentioning finding a friend in France may in fact imply that Henry believed that the Americans should choose a French candidate instead due to the cordial and close relations between the two countries. Finally, separately, there is a quote attributed to von Steuben by his biographer, Joseph Kapp. While in a circle of friends, von Steuben was apparently asked about the idea of inviting Prince Henry to rule America. Steuben responded, quote, As far as I know the prince, he would never think of crossing the ocean to be your master. I wrote to him a good while ago what kind of fellows you are. He would not have the patience to stay three days among you, end quote. Here, Steuben treats the suggestion as a bit of a joke, and simply dismisses it as such according to his biographer. But was this an idea he took more seriously than he let on? Ultimately, America did not even come close to choosing a monarchy. The same year the letter was written, 1787, the Constitutional Convention laid the framework for the modern American system of government. The Constitution came into effect on March 4, 1789. And thus, quietly, any consideration of placing Prince Henry on an American throne faded away. The whole idea was nearly lost to history completely, surviving only by chance, and indeed, few know of it even today. However, though this may be just a footnote in history, there is evidence to suggest that, for a short time, it was more than just a thought at the back of a few men's minds, and rather, was something that was being genuinely considered and privately discussed. Regardless of whatever likelihood that there was that this would have succeeded, it's interesting to consider how history would have played out had such a scheme worked. Would history be very different? It's certainly possible. Would it have substantially changed America's identity if the country chose a monarch, regarding King Henry I as a primary founding father? Absolutely. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, I invite you to come check out the rest of Fire of Learning and to subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. To help support the channel, there is a link to my Patreon page in the description. I'd like to thank our current patrons listed here for their support. Fire of Learning is also on Instagram, and I have a science channel called Lucinox, so come check that out too. Thank you for watching.